thank you, choir, and for all of these melodic presentations. Thank you, Crunch, for that moving prayer. To my fellow commentators of Calvary, and to each of you this morning, we are deliciously proud to see you and trust that you had a wonderful Christmas. It's kind of difficult, and I know it, for us to get up on and come to church when Christmas is on Saturday. Wait till next year, it's going to be on Sunday. Trust that you've had a glorious time. And to see all of your family members present here with you today. I know a lot of people who are out, but yet we thank God for you who are present here this morning. My mother-in-law is here. She visits us often. You've met her many times, Mrs. Thomas. And my wife's sister, Peggy, is also in order. Just wave your hand. We are very glad to see you. Let us continue to pray for Daddy Weaver. Uh, Dad is not doing well, still in intensive care. And it troubles me that I can't get up to see him because it's doctor's orders that nobody is supposed to see him. His system has shut down to the point that any visitation would discombobulate him. So I'm obeying orders, but it's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do not to be able to go and see about my daddy. I miss the conversations that we'd have almost twice each week. Can't talk with him right now, but we're gonna continue to pray that God will move. Continue to pray for Mom Weaver and Margaret as they visit with him, as they go out and just sit in the hospital. You know, some, sometimes we, and we don't mean any harm, we say let us pray for the sick, and we should. But you've got to pray for the caregivers too. Amen. Because the caregivers wear out. And sometimes the caregivers go in before the sick. So let us pray for mom and Margaret as they see about daddy. And I need you to pray for me too. I'm in a struggle of faith, a spiritual battle that I've never been in to this extent in my life. I've never had this kind of a struggle, not to this extent, I've had struggles but nothing to this extent. It's, it's a deep thing, and it's hard to talk about except with people of faith. Amen. And I want you to pray that God will, will move and that his will will be done. Uh, I gave you a passage of scripture on last Sunday that I told you to read, Amen. 2 Samuel 21, verses 15 through 22. When the giant Ishbibinob was coming against David, the Bible said that David waxed faint. He got tired. And Abishai said to him, you get out of the way. I'll fight. I'll step in and take care of the giant. And he stepped in because he said we cannot allow the light to go out of Israel. I want you to pray for me that the will of the Lord will be done. Um, it's a deep thing, and it's deeper than you can see. I want to talk this morning, and I'm not going to read this whole passage, in the second chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, Beginning with verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, 
wise men from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ, that is the anointed one, was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the wise men secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country uh, by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet out of Egypt, I called my son. And when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the wise men, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem in its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the wise men. Then what was said to the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. You may be seated. There is a misprint on our church's bulletin, our order of service. It says, the treat of Christmas. I'm not talking about the treat of Christmas talking about the threat of Christmas. That's our sermon title for the day, the threat of Christmas, not the treat. Dinah Washington used to sing years ago, what a difference a day makes. What a difference an alphabet makes. The threat of Christmas. Let us give Herod the great credit for having an insight to see the threat of Jesus that even the modern church with its heretical prognostications of prosperity cannot possibly see the threat of Jesus because of our theological perversions, we have inadvertently transformed Christianity into a feel-good cult. And we have made it the adjunct of right-wing politics in the United States of America. But one thing I must give Herod credit for, he had an insight that Jesus can be dangerous. So he sets out to kill him. Herod was quintessentially a megalomaniac. He was absolutely unequivocally insane. wasn't very bright. His neuroses and his psychoses were so glaring until even heaven took notice of it that this is a nut that has to be stopped. Here was a man who was 
king, fictitiously so, over the Jewish people from 37 B.C. until 4 B.C. He reigned for some 33 years. And when he hears the word that Jesus had been born and he was the king of the Jews, he knew there was a problem. And so he sets out to destroy Jesus. And when he couldn't do that, he took it out on others. Killed all the male children in Bethlehem. What a question of theodicy that is. A question of justice. All the male children killed. And of course, Jesus survives. What was the threat that Herod saw? First of all, he saw God in potentiality. Even though God comes as a baby, and some people don't believe that Jesus was God in the flesh, that he was a good man. Well, if he's a good man, then you ought to worship my daddy. He was a good man. And of course, you can't really say that uh, Jesus was a good man that never sinned because if he's not God, he's a liar and, 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 and he can't be perfect. Because he says in the Johannine gospel before Abraham was, I am. And Abraham lived some 1,700 years before the birth of Jesus. And how can you live, be in existence before Abraham when you were only born somewhere between 6 and 4 B.C.? He saw God in potentiality. He knew that Christmas was more than just simply turkey and gravy and dressing and cranberry sauce. Mistletoe and Christmas trees and decorations. He knew better than that. He said it's more that, that does not meet the eye. God in potentiality. See, we believe that according to the incarnation of Christianity, not the reincarnation, not the incarnation, in, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And we skip to verse 14 in John 1, and it says, And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, pitched his tent among us, moved in, got a mailbox in Nazareth, moved in with us, and we beheld his dopes, his glory, as only monogamous pater, only begotten of full of grace, charis, and alethia, truth. But you know, he, he, he had to wrestle with God growing on you. Here comes God as a baby. And if he lived in our days, we say in pampas. And your mama has to clean you. And since we live in a society, in a postmodern world where the men are changing diapers too, Joseph has to get up at night because these women are not going to just change diapers. They, 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 they make a contract with you now, brothers, before they get pregnant. Now, this is yours too. See, years ago, you could run that game and say, here, this is yours. I'll catch up with him when he's ready to go out for spring football. But you got to change him too. Can, can you imagine God having to be changed? Can you imagine God hanging on his mother's breast? And yet that's God. Can you imagine that? Isn't, doesn't that just blow your mind? That God does not come fully matured. Has to go through the pangs of living and life has to go down into Egypt and stay for a number of years. We don't know how long he stayed down there. But the next time we hear from him after he comes back and eventually ends up in Nazareth, the next time we hear from him is at the age of 12 when he's in the temple. 
And then that is almost like Nixon's 18 minute uh, gap on the tape. There's an 18 year gap. We don't know what he's doing from 12 to the age of 30. But we do know that he comes down to the Jordan River and he is baptized by John the Baptizer, who is his cousin. And the fact that he doesn't come grown says something about our idolatry of maturation. God got something to say through children that he does not invariably say through us. A child shall lead them. The late Harry Emerson Fosdick, and I'm going to rush this morning. The late Harry Emerson Fosdick, who was pastor of the Riverside Church in New York City from 1926 to 1946, and was uh, born in Buffalo, New York, 1878, and uh, died in 1969, uh, uh, and was the Lyman Beach lecturer at Yale in 1924. Dr. Harry Emerson Fosdick uh, was in the lobby of his church one day, and uh, a little boy asked, Mama, who is this? She said, this is a, a statue of Moses. Who is this? This is a statue of Abraham. Who is this? This is a statue of Isaac. Who are these? These are the 12 apostles. She said, well, Mom, who is this? She said, this is Jesus. She said, well, why is he like that? She said, well, he was killed. She said, well, why did they kill him? Was he a nice guy? Say, well, yes, he's the best ever. She said, well, I, I don't understand. Why would they kill somebody that nice? In other words, the boy saw the threat that Herod saw, but we, we don't see. He's a threat in potentiality, what God is going to be. There's some things about God that you don't yet understand, and God is going to catch up with you. And you want to look at God and say, Lord, is this you? I thought when I first started in the faith that you were this, but now I'm discovering that you are that. I saw you over there, and now I'm seeing you over here. And then you got to start dismantling some of your mess. You got to start getting rid of it. Because he ain't going for it. Herod saw the threat to his position. Herod was king <laughs> of the Jews. He's a king. And here he hears through the grapevine. And Marvin Gaye is saying, heard it through the grapevine? He hears through the grapevine that there is not just a baby being born, but the baby is a king. Of the Jew. So you got two kingdoms in conflict. You got the kingdom of God and you got the kingdom of man. And anytime Jesus shows up, another king is in town. Now he's not like one of these local kings. He is not like uh, 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 David and Solomon and Saul. He's not, no, no. he's not like Hezekiah. And Josiah, because all of these were great kings, but they all had to die. But this king shall live forevermore. Then he was threatened because he was a person that was struggling with perceived there is nothing more deleterious to you to think that you got something you don't have. Even on your job. I knew a brother several years ago and he was throwing his weight around on the job. He was an ebony brother. He's a black brother. And he was throwing his weight around on the job. You got to understand something. When you're working for other folk, and even when they elevate you to a certain position, <laughs> you ain't in charge. <laughs> you're not in charge. And if you're dumb enough to believe you're in charge, just keep it up. As Clyde McFadden used to say, and see what happens. Herod was a king. He called himself a king. But, but you know how he got to be king? 
Mark Antony that Shakespeare talks about in his classic Julius Caesar. Mark Antony who gave the funeral ration for Julius Caesar when he was killed on March uh, 15, 44 BC. Mark Antony recommended this nut to Caesar Augustus. Yes, he did. And that's how he got to be king. The people had no say in it. And the other thing about it, he wasn't a Jew. He was an Edomite. He was a descendant of Esau rather than a descendant of Jacob. So therefore, he was not legitimate. And whatever position you have that God didn't give you, and God didn't anoint you for, you got hell on your hand. Whatever you have, I, I don't want to be in a church where the Lord doesn't want me to be. I'd rather have 10 members on the tree and be in the will of God than to have 10,000 and be out of the will of God. He was an evil man. But you know, some folk just love titles. And we the same way in the local church. We love titles. Chairman of this and chairman of that and chairman of this and chairman of that. You better fall in love with Jesus. Did you hear what I just said? You better fall in love with Jesus. You mean you can't sing in the choir if you're no longer the president of the choir? You can't work on the usher board if you're no longer the president? Anywhere I can serve, you ought to be willing to serve. You don't have to give me a title. Anywhere I can serve, I'll, I'll serve the Lord. He had perceived power, but no actual power. Colin Powell was Secretary of State, and Colin Powell is a very nice man. Because one thing I can give Colin Powell credit, he always, no matter who, he always stands up for affirmative action. And he always says this. He said, you know, I wouldn't have made it to where I am if it had not been for the sacrifices of Martin Luther King and Ralph David Abernathy and Jesse Jackson and Andrew Young and White Walker. He said, I wouldn't have made it. Fannie Lou Hamer. He said, because they stood up, I'm able to stand up. So I can respect a guy like that. But did you think Colin had power? And let me go a step further. Do you think Condi Baby got power? <laughs> when you in Pharaoh's palace, yes. nobody has the power but Pharaoh. Yes, I cannot blow my nose without Pharaoh's permission. Then Jesus threatened his proclivity for violence. This nation was founded on violence. This is a violent nation. And we try to skate the issue of the intrinsicality of that violence by putting the thought to run our test. And Jermaine O'Neal. Problem with violence is deeper than Jermaine O'Neal. Nobody got killed that day. I, I'm, I'm not in favor of going in the stands after fans. But I'm just saying nobody got killed. But at the same time, these hypocrites were talking about the fight that took place between Indiana and the Pistons. Boys and girls, men and women were dying in Iraq. And we're talking about violence. That's the way we got the country. We didn't have a, a, a collective prayer meeting and then all of a sudden we became the United States of America. We slaughtered the Indians. Took their land and then brought me from Africa. And made me whack the land for 246 years without a paycheck. And you got nerve enough to ask me what in the hell I want. I'll tell you what I want. Yes, 
You got violence all in your national anthem. Bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. What is that? Herod's answer is America's answer. If I can't stop it, I'll kill it. Why do you think Martin Luther King is not at Ebenezer Baptist Church today? Violence. Why do you think Medgar Evers was blown away in 1963? Violence. Why do you think Malcolm died in 65? Violence. So Jesus comes in as the prince of peace. He's a new kind of king. He offers peace to the world. And we ain't just about getting ready to go for peace. Because peace is too dangerous. Every apostle of peace has gotten killed, including Jesus. Mahatma Gandhi was blown away in 1948 by a Hindu fanatic because he was advocating peace between the Hindus and the Muslims. King was an apostle of peace. We blew him away on a balcony in Memphis, Tennessee. So therefore, Jesus is a threat. Martin King could come to any city in the South, in America, wouldn't even have a slingshot with him, and the governor would call out the National Guard. Now, if he'd come with some rifles, they knew how to handle that because that's right down his alley. But when you start coming, talking about loving your enemy, man, turning the other cheek, Doing good to those who despitefully use you, you're an entirely different ball game. Jesus was a threat to the hypocrisy of this guy. Hypocrisy means that you are an actor. You are not really that person. You are acting out that person. I saw this movie the other day. I saw it again called A Few Good Men. Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson, they were playing that part in that. But they, they, but, but, but they played the part so well until you didn't even think about what their names were, you know, Jack and, and, and Tom. They, they, you, you know, they, you, you just stuck with who they were playing. And that's what we do in the church. We play the part so well that we don't cover, we, 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 we think you're a Christian, but you're not really a Christian. Talk to me, somebody. It, 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 it was about, you know, I told you a story about 14, 15 years ago. It, it said that a man was bragging on, uh, uh, my older members uh, know this story, but let me give it to the new members. They weren't here. <laughs> it said a man was bragging on his mule, and he said, I got the smartest mule in the world. And my, my, my mule's name is Ned. He said, how smart is he? Say, he can tell you how many, how, how many testaments there are in the Bible. They all said, man, come on. So he can tell you even how many gospels. Say, all right, Ned, to, to tell him how many testament. One, two, old and new. <laughs> One, two, that stands for old and new. They said, how many gospels? He said, four. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then the man said, Ned, tell me how many hypocrites are in the church. <laughs> said the mule started tap dancing. Jesus is a threat. He's a threat to our culture. The culture is defined as the sum total of the way we think, the way we act, and the way we do. All of our folk ways and mores are tied up in what we call culture. Dr. H. Richard Niebuhr, the brother of Reinhold Niebuhr, who used to teach theology at uh, Yale University, wrote a book many years ago entitled Christ and Culture. And in that book, he talked about Christ against culture, Christ above culture, Christ beyond culture, and Christ the transformer of culture. You see, Jesus runs into us. We teach that if you want to get up, you got to step on people. You got to walk over people on your way up. 
as, as Glenn Campbell used to sing, there have been many horizons, there have been many ups and downs on my way to my horizon like a rhinestone cowboy. But you better be careful who you walk over. You're going to reap what you sow. Are you with me? And if you end up getting that which God doesn't want you to have, he's going to snatch it from you. You won't even be able to sleep at night. Every time you go to the restroom, you're going to think some of the girls are back there talking about you. Every time you come back from, the, from your lunch break, you want to be thinking somebody is talking about you. And guess what? They were talking about you. Herod was a hypocrite. You know why I say he told the wise men, say, as soon as you find out where he is, I want to come and worship him. He was a hypocrite. He didn't want to worship Jesus. He wanted to kill Jesus. This was culture. Culture. Jesus runs into our culture. Notice that we don't even invoke the name of Jesus when we start talking about peace. When we got ready to go into Iraq, we called a meeting at the National Cathedral had Billy Graham there and all of them there. And the only person that made any sense that day was the black chaplain who got up and prayed a prayer, Lord, let us keep us from the insanity of becoming that which we oppose. Hello. I said, boy, if I were close to you, I would run up to you and hug your neck. Pull out one of these $20 bills I got in my pocket and say, let's go to lunch. God will never be without a witness. Somebody somewhere will stand up for God. I got to hasten on. Jesus threatened the arrogance of Herod. The arrogance, you know, arrogance is the exaggeration of your finitude. You think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. And the young folks say, you ain't all that. No, 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 no. You are here today because God let you be here. You couldn't wave your hand if it, was, if it were not for the Lord. Just take your hand right now and wave it. Nobody allowed you to do that but God. You couldn't comb your hair without the Lord. You can even brush your teeth without the law. You can't put on your shoe without God. You can't put on your socks without God. You can't put on your false teeth without God. You can't put your wig on without God. All of my hair come from the law. His arrogance. You know, I remember reading that whenever the Roman conquerors would come and capture a subject king, they would always lead him back into town. He would come in after the Caesar riding in his victory chariot and another man would march behind him reading this writing. Remember that all power is fleeting. Don't care what you got now. You may not have it forever. Can I get some help in here? Immediately after the Pope has been selected in the Vatican in Rome, the choir immediately starts singing. Soon the glories of this life will all be past. And only what you do for Christ 